Britain. There's only one type of ship that can be built fast enough and in large enough quantities. A Corvette. Anybody who could bend steel and drive a rivet really could build a Corvette. Um, so the idea was that you have a simple uh, technology, a simple design, which you can mass produce. And you don't need a specialized shipyard to build it, and you don't need specialists in the sense of, uh, of highly trained naval engineers to actually make it go once you get it in the water. By late 1940, almost 70 are under construction in Canadian shipyards. Rear Admiral Nellis, the architect of the Navy's expansion, will need thousands of new recruits to man them. Churchill calls the Corvettes the cheap and nasties. Cheap to build and nasty for the U-boats. Corvettes are fitted with a four-inch gun at the front and two depth charge rails on the stern. These sturdy ships were originally designed to hunt whales. Their tried and tested steam engines are good at short sprints, useful too in catching U-boats. But their basic old-fashioned design is limited. The original intent of the Corvette uh, in terms of its service was pretty humble. These were going to be the kind of um, jacks of all trades inshore. No one expected these vessels ultimately to carry the burden of the war in the North Atlantic. In rough open seas, it's the crews who take the full force of the Corvette's unsuitability. The bridge is completely open. It's like a great big bathtub. So you're, you're getting it from the sea breaking over the, over the front and, and from the weather pouring down from the top. When the Corvettes get out to mid-ocean, they find that the weather is just too severe for them. They perform abysmally. People were often wet for days on end. Sleeping in wet clothes, working in wet clothes, it's cold and it's quite often frightening. But by late 1940, they're so desperately needed that many sail before being fully equipped. And in a couple of cases, just to give them some semblance of combat capability, they actually put uh, uh, telephone poles up on the, on, the, on the gun deck to kind of mimic a gun. A couple of them went across the North Atlantic with nothing more than a Lee Enfield rifle. But for now, the Corvettes are the best hope to defeat Hitler's U-boats. And out in the Atlantic, they're soon locked in combat with the wolf packs. Peter Koch was in the convoy which saw the first decisive Canadian Corvette U-boat action. It usually takes two ships to kill a submarine, one to sit to one side and ping, and the other one to drop the depth charges. So you go looking for it, you, you uh, do a, an Aztec sweep and uh, see if you can pick up a, uh, an echo. While steaming to reinforce a stricken convoy, Corvettes Chamblay and Moose Jaw detect a U-boat. Chamblay drops depth charges. U-501 surfaces. Spotting the U-boat, Moose Jaw alters course to ram the sun. A really sharp action uh, followed in which uh, there was a kind of a, a glancing blow by Moose Jaw. And uh, at, at that moment when the uh, the Corvette and the submarine were actually alongside one another. Uh, the captain of the U-boat actually stepped from his conning tower onto the forecastle of, of Moose Jaw. And then the ships managed to separate. The, the U-boat's crew actually got control of the submarine again. But then a bit of a chase took place until ultimately the, the sub was rammed and sunk. The U-boat commander and surviving crew of U-501 are taken prisoner. But the Corvettes can never be more than a stopgap measure. Throughout the autumn of 1940, the wolf packs remorselessly pick off the convoy ships like sitting ducks. The situation is critical. Supplies of food to Britain have fallen to the lowest level since the war began.